Well, my entire career has been in international development, and I've worked with a lot of leaders over the years. involved with uh, G20 uh, finance ministers and I've been involved with other figures such as Prince El Hassan of Jordan and uh, Tony Blair and I was involved with Gordon Brown and also um, Nicolas Sarkozy. So these are all people who have helped to shape some of my views about what I think may be lying ahead in terms of the uh, global political and economic situation. while most of the workforce is paying a higher price in lower living standards and shrinking real wage. Big business is hoarding and watching from the sidelines. But that's capitalism. What can we do? We are many of us wage slaves. I am hooked on my monthly fix to pay my bills, to pay my plan given to St. James's, and the occasional visit to the opera. I have a bank account with a big five, and um, I support Amazon.co.uk, who pays no UK tax on uh, seven billion pounds in sales. Okay, I could be more discerning with my consumption choices, but make no mistake, I am a colluder. And it is here that James's thesis of the commons economy that most intrigues me. What can I, what can we do as wage slaves to positively affect change for myself and the generations to come? Why would his model of all models work when most world religions have been teaching values of stewardship for millennia? What is the link between faith values of covenant and stewardship with a game plan, if there is one, for moving from red-blooded capitalism to this economy of the commons, short of revolution. Which, if you've been watching the weekend news, doesn't seem too far off. God's covenant with Abraham continues to have a profound impact on us. Echoing the Edenic Covenant, God told Abraham to be fruitful and multiply, and that his progeny would be blessed. So why has Western society narrowed this contract to mean only material growth? Does it not also mean spiritual replenishment and creation? During the Reformation and the Enlightenment, Society rejected the oligarchies of the king and the church. This led to the modern era of individualism. The protection of the rights of the individual could have deepened our capacity for spiritual understanding so that each of us would sustain our body to allow our mind to explore the higher realms of being. But, Individualism has been interpreted very differently, so that following Enlightenment philosophers like John Locke, the person is seen as a mental substance and the body its material property. Rather than bring us creative spiritual power, modern individualism has been captured by the systems of materialism. Yet, this overemphasis on rational and deductive thought in materialism, rather than our creative and inductive capacities, as in spirituality, goes back much further in history. It was ancient Rome which suppressed the covenant that originated in Eden with creation through Abraham and was carried on through Jesus. 
Today, materialist Rome has revived itself in another form, the confluence of business and government, the market and state. The material forces that once led Rome now lead the market state in creating a political force designed to oppress humanity. Its doctrines teach that matter is the ultimate reality and that we are all just individuals trying to survive. It denies that our physical bodies are here to support our minds in order that our minds might connect with their higher source. And in ignoring our common heritage, our covenant with God, we are left empty and deeply unfulfilled. When Abraham promised God that his children would be fruitful and multiply, did this mean that we should be mastered by materiality and time? Was it God's intention that we become slaves to boom and bust cycles and compulsory growth and the concentration of wealth and the devaluation of social capital? Our ancestors interpreted spiritual belief as the process of saving their souls, faith in their creator, trust in their sisters and brothers, and the value found in Christ. Now we speak of saving money, faith in the government that issues it, trust in the banks that distribute it, and the value we find in this money. Indeed, the interest rate which expresses the value of our currency is tantamount to God in this secular age. That's because compound interest, increasing at a fixed rate over long periods, seems to achieve the immortality that we can never attain in our short lifespans, the power to conquer time. Indeed, interest rates grow faster than human beings. Money literally continues to live on and increase after we die which is the closest thing to eternal life that exists for most people in a culture which no longer believes in God. By linking the past with the future through linear time, interest rates tie our consciousness to materiality, making us slaves to the outer world. These interest rates, which express the material growth of money, take us out of this present moment and our capacity for creation so we are no longer able to see ourselves as individuals who are parts of a greater whole. Debt-based interest rates empower our body-denominated culture where the higher mind is absent and the human spirit is suppressed. It is interest-driven debt that drives the competition for scarce resources, reinforcing our mind-body split and providing the instrument for our own oppression. Individual and social conflict are both the result of competition. We're all in such a rush to compete, we're not replenishing what we consume. We don't allow time in our lives for the processes of natural transformation. Interest rates drive this hyper-competition, -com causing us to consume our finite resources and short the natural cycles of creation. How long will Earth continue to support life if we continue to degrade and destroy it? The commons, as a consciously organized sector beyond the market and state, creates a more beneficial balance in economics and society, putting us back in touch with the natural cycles of life. The commons, including social, cultural, intellectual, digital, solar, natural, genetic, and material resources are already becoming a potent alternative to the materialism of the market state. In many places across the world, people who share their commons are managing them through unique forms of self-governance and collaboration, which protect the gifts of creation by ensuring their long-term sustainability. Whether these commons are traditional, rivers, forests, indigenous cultures, or emerging solar energy, intellectual property, internet, communities are taking collective action to preserve their resources 
both for themselves and for future generations. The common responsibility of people to protect and sustain their valuable common goods is really a spiritual act, whether or not this is consciously recognized. When people come together to manage a resource through trust, cooperation, and sharing, they link with each other subjectively. This creates physical and social interdependencies. It ensures a freer flow, a freer flow of our creative energies across the artificial boundaries of private property and sovereign borders, which otherwise impede and distort human intersubjectivity and create separations between people. When we co-create the commons, we invest in one another. This is really a process of replenishment. By co-creating the commons, we replenish ourselves as individuals, society as a whole, and the natural world. That's why the new ethic of personal development, social cohesion, and ecological sustainability, which is rapidly spreading across the world, is far more in line with the spiritual teachings of the world's religions than the present system of debt-based economics, which creates separation and division. The age-old vision of spirituality is being realized through our calling to become trustees of the world's resources to preserve and restore the very things we have promised would bear fruit and multiply. We express the commons through our collective intentions for sustainability, not through the Romanization of society by the market state. The dualism between materiality and spirituality that came out of Rome expressed human existence in terms of physical sustenance and physical survival, separating mind from body. But the commons is lifting the masses to the guidance of the higher mind and the creative world, which are intended to be our inheritance, bringing mind and body into a unified force of evolution. It is our covenant to create unity on the planet by replenishing its living and material systems. The Edenic covenant and Abraham's covenant with God to be fruitful and multiply expresses not only the right to grow, but also our responsibility to steward this growth. Consumption is about replenishing ourselves merely at a material level. We must also replenish ourselves at our higher being. And it is this creative spirit which will lead us to replenish society and nature and bring economic healing into our world. So long as interest rates remain our God, artificially speeding up life and preventing the sustainability of creation, we shall remain in this endless cycle of consumption until we destroy ourselves and our planet. But we can break these chains of debt and scarcity and transform the world of necessity. This is what the commons brings to us. The self-governance of our commons based on unity and creation. Confederation of world citizens based on collective intentions to produce a sustainable community on the planet. Our beloved commons must be created and restored for the benefit of everyone. To be fruitful and multiply, we must replenish ourselves and leave to future generations a peaceful and sustainable society that supports individual growth and spiritual advancement. We can create plenty in our world by ensuring that it is used wisely and sustainably so that everyone will meet their needs today, tomorrow, and hundreds of years into the future. Let's think of our commons as the new economics of replenishment. Thanks so much. I think the reason I've been asked is just to save my four minutes um, is, is on the basis of my recently completed doctoral thesis um, on the theology of money, of which the central point is that the problems of our world are intimately related to the institution of money. Not, I am emphasize, that I'm not disagreeing with it, the love of money, so that is a real problem. 
but the institution of money itself. And um, from that point of view, I, I would just say how very interested I was to hear James say that he thought the present God was the rate of interest. Um, very briefly, I mean, because there isn't time to say anymore, and it's probably been said already many times, the Christian faith, as I see it, is totally behind. But certainly the long-term Christian tradition is totally behind um, the sustain, sustaining um, the, the world in which we live. And uh, I, I, I hardly think I need to uh, argue that question. Um, but my own point is how the institution of money has come in and spoiled things so much. Um, not many people seem to uh, realise perhaps that inadvertently John Locke himself drew attention to this. Um, when he's, he suggested that it was the, the introduction of money into the world that enabled some people to get much more of the world than others. Um, I've got a quotation here. It is plain that men have agreed to disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. They, having by tacit agreement and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land for himself than he himself can use. And this is through the introduction of money. And it is certainly my opinion that if we are going to sort out the ter terrible mess into which we've got ourselves, um, it's not going to be by continuing to produce more and more debt. Uh, personally, I see this as a recipe for absolute disaster and really do feel that we could have a, a real collapse of the world economy not very far around the corner. And I think the present Eurozone crisis is a harbinger of it. We've got to take, the, take hold of the nettle and completely transform our financial system so that it is not based on debt and it is not based on interest rates. Because they are what drives everything. It, it is the, the, the need to make a profit on your investment that continually uh, produces all the ridiculous investment that goes on. Um, just, this is not my book, but if anyone wants to read a real theological assessment of this whole thing, it's this book called Property. I'm sure you know this one. Um, by Ulrich Dukra and Franz Hinkel Amat. Um, Marvellous, deep theological book. Otherwise, of course, you can read my thesis, which you can find on the Exeter University website. But I just make this, this, these two points, really, which I'm sure James is totally behind, but just to make them absolutely clear. First of all, that I do believe that Christian faith uh, demands and requires um, that we conserve the universe, that we do not allow the resources of the universe to be held by one or two people to the detriment of all the rest. But secondly, to make this big point that whatever great ideas we may have, until we come to actually reform totally our monetary system, we are not really getting to the root of the problem. we have seen the earth from space, we have seen it as one planetary body that gives life to a diversity of creatures, including ourselves. And this brings home the radical oneness of earthly life, 
while daily use of the term globalization signals a growing realization that Earth's planetary system works as a whole. Works as a whole to sustain its multiplicity of creatures. So, we often talk about an elephant in the room. There is an elephant in this church, a real elephant. Think about that creature, that wonderful creature, one of billions, who now depends on us, on us, to be able to live. And globalization means a lot of things, but it signals our failure to react positively to its implications and who share their share of the commons with us, whether they will it or not. To a certain extent, we can use, we can decide whether we will use them or not. They are dependent on what is immediately available to them. Yet, the implications of belonging within the Earth's commons have had hardly any impact on the conduct of major economies or within Western societies as a whole. To a very limited extent, climate change and loss of biodiversity are beginning, we hope, to influence global political and economic policies. But the very terminology can be a barrier. I mean, who outside of a scientific elite has noticed changes to the global nitrogen cycle, for instance? Certainly, I haven't. And my ignorance is typical. But that ignorance becomes important, even dangerous, when sanctified by a long-held Western religious tradition that ignores and devalues the things of this world in favour of one yet to come. And this has been supported by an illusion because that is what it is, that as a species, God gave us dominion over all others who, like us, depend on Earth's commons. So we have assumed and continue to assume that all other species and our shared resource space are there to serve us primarily and our particular interests alone. This claim to superiority, for that is what it is, as James has pointed out, is supported philosophically and religiously by the notion that the faculty of reason or an immortal soul have been given to our species alone. So, while our belonging to Earth has been obvious at one level, we're all subject to the law of gravity, our planetary oneness with all Earth's creatures has been ignored at best, and the st stability of our shared world has been undermined. Within our own species, some are rated higher than others on grounds of race, gender, intellect, creed, or wealth. Some of them have been named here today. Politically, this is seen as an expedient way 
of assigning power to those best able or willing to use it. But the underlying presupposition that each subordinate level is to be valued only in terms of its usefulness to those above it. So other species and their environments are now rated economically by us in terms of wealth, accumulation, or environmental destruction. Religiously, this hierarchical consciousness is routinely ratified in the name of God. But it is decisively rejected in the wisdom writings. For example, when Job orders so far, Ask the beasts, and they will teach you the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or the plants of the earth, they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you. In the Lord's hand is the life of every living being. Gaia, the earth and its living systems, presents for us the opportunity to remodel the monetary system. And it's not something that we have clearly envisioned yet, but I think in the long term this is going to become clearer and clearer, especially for our children and their grandchildren. It's a pretty challenging model for us right now, but it's it's very quickly uh, being discussed. Now, now, there's not a lot of cohesion around this discussion yet, but I see more and more people who recognize that um, these problems have to be discussed in this way. Imagine a monetary system that uses a reserve asset of a variety of kinds, a basket, as it were, or a selection of or a grouping of many different kinds of commons that are averaged together in terms of their value to, to, and in terms of their sustainable value to create a new kind of sustainability rate that indicates the relative sustainability of the planet. And mo moving forward, that's the kind of thing that could become the basis of a new monetary system. It's very simply put in 30 seconds. So behind that is a, a lot of uh, discussion. And we're almost out of time, but I, I do want to underpin uh, that remark by saying, at the moment, charitable organizations and, and all of us really who want to see change take place, what other opportunity do we have to sustain ourselves financially? But um, take out mortgages, apply for loans, student loans, credit cards. We're still based in, in, a, in a system that requires interest rates and requires a debt-based economy. So, um, you know, we protect ourselves by trying to pay down our debts personally and institutionally and keep it, keep it solvent, but the situation is very difficult for those who want to do things and make investments that are uh, green solutions to problems. The problem is that moving forward, what's happening is that if we're going for the biggest return on investment, it helps to reify the system as it presently exists. And we put, we put lots of our mental energy into thinking about solving problems in a, in a more cohesive way along the lines of social justice and environmentalism and peace and, and all that good stuff. And yet at the same time, our pension funds and other investments are actually going into the fossil fuel economy and generating more and more debt. So it's a problem. How do we solve that problem? Very quickly, um, for institutions moving forward, we begin to develop two sets of books. The one book we take very seriously about how we're engaged in the present system. The other set of books, and it's maybe just an experiment, maybe it's just 
a useless activity, but the other set of books develops our own internal quality of life indicators, well-being indicators, sustainability indicators that show us how we would be behaving at this point fiscally within that organization if it weren't for interest rates. In other words, if those indicators were to begin to model a kind of situation in which the organization was existing in a world where um, it could exchange on the basis of sustainability or barter or alternative currencies or trade, um, those metrics that are developed by each organization really contributes a lot to the measures for sustainability that we need to evolve. What are these indicators? There are a lot of them out there. There are, you know, and part of the problem is there's nothing that's really standardized yet. And the whole field of alternative indicators is, is still very um, incoherent and inco incohesive in, in a lot of ways. But there are people doing really good work in alternative currencies and, and other kinds of indica alternative indicators that I suggest you look at, inclusive wealth indicators and there are in some of the things that have already been mentioned here. Um, why keep two sets of books? Because we're modeling the future right now. Because we need the resilience. Someone asked me earlier, and I know I'm over time here, so just give me one, one more minute. Um, we are modeling the future, and uh, someone asked me earlier, well, none of this sounds like it's really driving efficiency. And I had said that, you know, the complexity theory and, and many other models are showing us that, that maximizing efficiency creates brittleness in the system, and it breaks down, ultimately. Um, we need to have a balance between efficiency and resilience, and the resilience is what we're working on. This is what, why we have to become unified, more cohesive, with the vision of how these alternatives work, so that that second set of books actually begins to model the future that we're going to inhabit in the future. Thanks much.